Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. so happy to be here. <sighs> My name is Miley. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. My sobriety date is July 13th, 1984. My sponsor is Ruth S. of, <laughs> of uh, Pacifica, California. And Ruth was very involved in living sober. She uh, and Dee were very involved. And she spoke, I believe, in 19. 19- 86, back when she just had 21 years of sobriety. Uh, she now has 51 years of sobriety, and she has been a blessing to my life. So um, I'll be talking a little bit more about Ruth a little bit later. And my home group is Each Day a New Beginning, 7 a.m. on Friday. I tend to be there on Fridays. It's Monday through Friday. Anyone out there, Each Day a New Beginning? Yeah? All right. It's a great group. So if you can get up at 7 a.m., I would strongly encourage you to join us. So um, I, always, I always bring my book. I always bring my book when I share. Mainly, I don't worry, I'm not going to read much, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm a bit of a thumper. I, uh, and I, I, you know, I think it's because when I was new, there was a lot I didn't understand. I was a very young person. I was a very confused person. It took me years, honestly, years and years to understand some things that, you know, I think because some people go to rehab and they learn a lot quick. I went to Valencia Street. I did not learn a lot quick. I, I just, I just bless my heart. I just was super confused about a lot of things. So, uh, I really, it's not my purpose to lecture or to teach or to do anything like that other than if you're new, this is a really great book. I would encourage you to, um, to get it and, uh, to read it. And for me, it's, it's, it's best to read with someone else. You know, I've, uh, it, when I came in, it seemed, almost like a foreign language. Uh, and so, but sitting down and reading it with, a, with another alcoholic, it became crystal clear. So um, when I speak, I always have three goals. My first goal is to, of course, carry the message. That's my fondest wish, is that I could carry the message uh, of Alcoholics Anonymous. My second is to, uh, to not cry. I'm willing to cry later. I'm willing to cry tomorrow. I really don't want to cry right now today. But there's something about Alcoholics Anonymous that just really just opens my heart wide open. Just even someone introducing themselves as an alcoholic just, like, crushes me, you know? I think we are so blessed. And let me just speak for myself. I am so blessed, you know? And when I think, if I just spend a moment thinking, just even to have one other person to be able to say, you know, that they're an alcoholic, I just think of, like... I was just, if, if, if more alcoholics could have this gift, you know, if only more members of my family were able to say <sighs> that they were an alcoholic, you know, we, this is such a precious thing. And that's why even, you know, I feel like I need AA now more, more than ever, you know, at 33 years. I mean, it's just today. All we have is today, you know, and I have a lot of todays for sure. And I'm happy about that. And I'm proud of it. I feel really good about it. But, um, you know, I, I do not ever want to leave AA, you know, and I don't, and I just, I don't want to ever stop appreciating what I've been given. The third thing of my goal is to not get stuck in the 80s. And that's, that's, <laughs> that's easy to do. And sometimes I think if I could just say these things out loud, then maybe, maybe, maybe they will come to be, you know. So, um, so again, carry the message. Don't cry. Don't get stuck in the 80s, you know. And uh, the 80s were awesome, I will say. Um, the, the other thing I want to say is that... Um, I just cannot thank everyone who, I can't thank enough everyone who's worked here on Living Sober. I mean, absolutely every single person. (laughs) 
It is so many weekends, so many evenings, so many working things out, negotiating. I mean, it's, and, and I mean, really, absolutely everything. I mean, Patrick did such a beautiful job here with this logo. Ter you know, Teresa. I mean, what a lover. What a lover. Who could have ever imagined she could be anything other than what she is right now? You know, what a blessing you are to all of us. And just everyone, every single person who's on a committee, every single person in registration, everyone who, you know, sold a raffle ticket. Absolutely. It took everyone's effort to make this happen. And it's a lot of work, and it happens all year long. And, um, you know, living sober... I don't know how I think I'm not going to cry the whole time. <laughs> but living sober means so much to me. And I, I tell anyone who will listen. But, I mean, it's it, and I'll get more into this later because I like to follow the traditional format. Of course I do. Why? I like to follow traditional format of what I was like, what happened, and what I was like now. But I do want to jump ahead and say about living sober that, you know, living sober was my very first AA meeting. I had never even been to a meeting before I came to Living Sober in 1984. And I'll tell you the tale about how I wandered in here. I came all by myself. And not only was it my very first AA meeting, it, it became my first day of sobriety. You know, and they had it, they had it on uh, July 13th that year. It was a Friday the 13th. And, uh, and I would encourage everyone here, newcomers, middle timers, old timers alike, just love your sobriety day. Just, just love your sobriety day. Whatever, even if you've, even if you've had to have a new sobriety day, you know, and I love my sobriety date. I love the seven. I love the 13 and I love the 84. I love everything about it. There's nothing I don't love about my sobriety date. And you know, it's a Friday the 13th, and that just was perfect. It couldn't have been more perfect, you know. And um, and that and that was living sober that year. That was Friday, of living sober. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the, I mean, living sober saved my life. And the, the, what's so special about living sober for me is that it's an LGBT conference. I do not know how long. I, I mean, I you know me, okay? I am AA through and through. I mean, you know. I love I love gay AA, I love straight AA, but once I'm there it's not straight, right? So, you know, <laughs> but uh that I think it would have taken me I honestly I I mean I'd like to think that AA would have saved my life no matter what, but I don't know how long that would have taken just because of me. I just don't know how long it would have taken for me to wander in. I mean, the fact that I was so damaged and it took me so long to find living sober is a miracle. Um so that's super important to me because um, that's, that's how the magic happened for me. The magic happened was that I saw lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender people in a room who were clean and sober. That's, that's everything it took for me, you know. So I just so appreciate all the work that you all do. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say a little bit about that living sober because I think it's kind of amusing. Um, without getting into the details of my particular story, but uh, I was looking at the archives, and I, I just, and the other thing I appreciate is that the website that Living Sober has, and that you can look at the program for every single year that, um, the, that, that Living Sober has happened. So I went back to 1984, I looked, oh my goodness gracious, there was a nurse on duty. <laughs> How great is that? I think that is hilarious that there was a nurse on duty. Oh, my goodness gracious. That was so cute. And, and, uh, and of course, there were a lot of instructions about, you know, smoking on this side, non-smoking on that side. That was awesome. That's how a lot, and I was a smoker, but a lot of my early years of sobriety are hilarious that we thought it made any difference to sit on one side of the room. That kills me. But another big thing about 1984, and again, oh, girl, please don't cry, uh, is that was the beginning of AIDS, really. I mean, it had been 81, 82, 83. But in, in 84, I mean, and it doubled every year, you know. I, I think, it, you know, like, so say like 3,000 people died in 84, then in 85, 6,000 people died, then 12,000 people died, then 20, on and on and on. And that's where, you know, here we were, right here in San Francisco. And I looked at the program for 1985, and it said, it, this is a it had two quiet rooms, and we called it back then. We called it AIDS and ARC. 
right? A, like an AIDS-related condition, I believe. And we called it HTLV3 was the virus, you know? And, um, and they had two quiet rooms for people with HIV, or, I mean, I mean, AIDS arc is what we called it. And one was smoking and one was non-smoking. <laughs> Oh, I love us. Thank God. Thank God, right? Thank God for us, right? And then, um, and I mentioned also that my sponsor, uh, spoke and she was, she was chair many years and, uh, and then she, she also spoke. And I'll just never forget that being a Bill Graham auditorium. It was just like a dream come true. The other thing I want to say is, you know, for me, um, I just thought of this analogy just the other day where, and I think in hearing the other speakers that have been so great that, um, for me, you know, I was like, it felt like I was in the bottom of a well and people, some people didn't know I was in the well. Some people knew I was in the well and they, they tried to help me and, some people were like, I'd like to help you, but I'm too high, you know? So <laughs> there were, there were all sorts of people, you know, the people that knew, the people that didn't even know I was missing, right? And, and that's the difference. That when I connected with Alcoholics Anonymous, it was literally like a, like, you know, a dry, strong hand reached down and pulled me up. That's exactly what happened. You know, other people had tried, but I would just slip out of their grip, you know. I just couldn't connect. I just, you know, they'd be like, well, Miley, why don't you stop drinking? I'd be like, all right. And then I'd just, I'd be at the well. I'd start to pull up and then slip back down to the bottom over and over. And it took me two years. I tried every single day for two years to quit drinking. And uh, But it, once I went to my very first AA meeting, it was honest to God. It was magical. And it was right here at Living Sober. And it was gay people and reaching down to me, really strong, really firm, just boom. Here you are, sister. Boom. And pulled me up. So, you know, I'm going to go back a little bit. And sometimes when I when I go to AA meetings and I hear people share, I um, I get scared for them. And I think, oh, my God, is this, how is this going to turn out? Like, is this going to be okay? You know, and I get, even no matter, even though they're right in front of me, and I, and I think like, oh, my Lord. And so I want to reassure you, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little dicey at first. It's going to, it's, it's, and I hate to stress you out, so, you know, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. And, uh you know, I think, uh, and just know that it's all going to turn out okay, you know, <laughs> and uh, my life is golden. It really is. And, you know, I don't ever want people to feel like I'm bragging about, oh, my life is so great, but it's just that it's a miracle. My life is great and it's not rich. It's not this, it's not that, but it's like, it's, it, my life is golden. It is golden. And, uh, and, but it wasn't always that way. And so, uh, so anyway, I did, uh, get sober when I was 21 years old. And I think sometimes that can seem like, gosh, that's so young. What, what could have happened <laughs> that would cause someone to stop drinking by the age of 21 years old? And I'm going to tell you that. Uh, <laughs> so, and, and, and honestly, I really start, started trying when I was 19. Like I said, it took me two years to find AA. But um, so already at 19, I was wiped wiped out and I was, um, exhausted. I w felt hopeless. And, um, I think the thing that's for me about my story, it was never about denial. Um, I didn't really suffer from denial. I knew I was an alcoholic. I knew I had problems with a variety of things, but, um, but I just couldn't, I just couldn't stop on my own. I didn't know how to stop. So again, it wasn't that I didn't know. I knew, I knew, and I wanted, and I tried to get help. But um, I just couldn't stop on my own. And I believe, for me, I don't think I can stay sober on my own. You know, I, that's why you're going to be seeing me here with my little walker in 20 years, okay? So, uh, you know, I, I have every intention of being here for the rest of my life because I, I have no delusions that I can stay sober on my own. And I also think that even though I've had success for 33 years, I think it's I know that I can relapse just like anyone else can relapse, you know. Um, so for me, I started drinking when I was 14 years old. And um, 
And uh, I love Ted so much. Ted did such a great job the other day, and I've asked him five times to repeat exactly what he said. But what he said, and I'll probably not get it quite right, but he said, oh, something that's seemingly bad basically turned into something good. That's the story of my life, right? If you ever, you know, get a little headstone, that's what the headstone would say, is something seemingly bad turned into something good. And um, I would say for me, I think another reason why living sober means so much to me is that if I had to say there was two, like, big tragedies in my life, it would be one, being gay, and two, being an alcoholic, you know. So for me to be here at Living Sober, which is an LGBT uh, conference for alcoholics, you know, it's a total win, right? It's a total win. And um, so for me, uh, I grew, I want to just say that I did grow up around a lot of alcoholics, and for me, that was a blessing. Um, I... Uh, and again, seemingly bad, turned out good. So uh, my grandfather went to state hospital in 1965. Coincidentally, that's the same year my sponsor went to state hospital. And um, she went to Mendocino State Hospital for the insane. All right. So... Uh, <laughs> and uh, my grandfather went to Agnew State Hospital, which was right, right down here in San Jose. And um, uh, so... I was with, I was in the courtroom apparently when they signed him in. He had uh, tried to k kill himself with putting a hose in the car. He had been asked not to drive his kids around anymore. <laughs> and one thing about my family, we love to drive. We love to drive. And, uh, you know, that's how it was when I drank. If I was at Amelia's, I wanted to be at Mods. If I was at Mods, I wanted to be at Clementina's, okay? I mean, I just wanted to be everywhere. And, and that followed me into the rooms too. If I was here, I wanted to be there. But, um, so anyway, he, he was asked not to drive us anymore, and then he tried to take his life. Um, he, uh, he ended up getting dry, and he was a good grandfather. He sadly did not go to AA, but he took ant abuse for 25 years, and uh, that's one way of doing it. Um, <laughs> it's, it that was rough. But, um, and my uncle moved in when I was nine years old, and he had a big, big influence on my life. And I always like to say, these were good men. They were not bad men. They were good men. But alcohol turned them into monsters. Um, he, uh, he moved in when I was nine, so I'd already known him for nine years, you know, and, uh, he had brain damage due to his alcoholism. He was just like these guys on Sixth Street, you know, you could smell the alcohol coming out of his skin and, uh, and he was my guy, you know, we, we, he, I'd come home from school, he'd be there, we'd watch TV together, we'd, you know, whatever, get a snack together. I'm the youngest by many years, so it's just him and I mainly, and uh, he was a vet, and so he would um, get his check at the beginning of each month and disappear, and I remember having so much worry about that. He'd come home, you know, beat up, and he just, you know, he never could get sober. You know, AA did come to our home once. It was super exciting. We all hid in the back. And, uh, and we were just really, we, and it was so much hope. We just really, we were so excited. And I don't even know how that how that 12-step call happened. But uh, anyway, bless his heart. Long story short is he uh, he talked to them and he came back and got us. And he's like, good news. I'm not an alcoholic. And uh, and uh, we said, yeah, we, we knew that's not how that had played out. But uh, he... Um, he was a good guy. But the point of all this is that I had a front row seat so that it didn't take long for me to know when I started drinking um, alcoholically, which was basically the first time I drank, I knew. I knew exactly what was happening. I knew what it was called. I knew the name. Um, things that happened to me as a result of my drinking. Um, basically, I think I had one sweet spot once, and then I just overshot it for the next eight years, you know. I just always was looking for that special special area. And... Um, and then things like all sorts of things. Well, okay, well, 14, um, this is the sketchy part, but I got involved with a married couple. And I'd been, and the, I, the thing I want to say is that I was really a good kid. I, uh, you know, I believed in God. I tried to please people. I um, took music lessons. I tried to do okay in school. I wasn't a genius, but I did my best. I uh, was really a good kid. And then the minute I started drinking, everything went to hell. Like that fast. I did never had a social drink in my life. I've never have I've never had a drink with a meal. Um, I've never, uh, you know, been to a cocktail party or anything like that. I uh, just had that drink and bam, 
things went bad for me. So again, I got involved with them, and then they went to Europe, and I, uh, I mean, that whole thing was a whole other story, but, uh, and I attempted suicide. Um, I was just so lost and confused, and I think I, I tried to tell my family what had happened. Believe it or not, I had my own prescription for Valium. Uh, my fam- the family doctor thought I was a little nervous. I don't know why I would be, but, uh, but, uh, and so I actually had my own prescription, and I overdosed on the Valium, and, and I, I tried to, uh, get someone's attention, but, the thing I know about my family is that I, when I came in, my, what I would say is that my story's really changed a lot. When I first came in when I was 21, I would probably, I would have been able to tell you the exact same facts, but just my perspective is, you know, thank God after so many years is really different. I, um, you know, at the time I probably would have said, oh, I was maybe neglected or that, um, people didn't care about me or that, things of that nature. What I can see now is that there were a lot of people with a lot of problems, you know, and it wasn't just my problem. I just happened to be the youngest and smallest problem, but a uh, person, but um, everyone there really had a lot of problems, you know, and I, and I do, in my case, I think they were doing the best they could. I don't think that's the case for everybody, you know, but that, for my case and my family, I feel like they were, now I can see that I think they were really doing the best they could under difficult circumstances and with a disease running rampant throughout the family. Um, so then I did attempt, so this is, so I did attempt suicide and it didn't seem, I wasn't able to get any response. And, um, and so believe it or not, I rode my bicycle down to suicide prevention, which was downtown. And, uh, and I wasn't even supposed to ride my bike that far. You know, I mean, that's how young I was that I wasn't even supposed to ride my bike that far. And, uh, and I did. And I went and for and I, some reason, I, I mean, I was seeking help, you know, and I told them what had happened and, and, uh, and they called my parents and my parents were like, Oh Lord. And, uh, and anyway, I was sent to a psychiatrist, and I can't say that it was very helpful, honestly, um, but um, it was just my first effort to try to get some kind of help. Uh, when I went to high school, I started at one high school, and then I switched to a different high school. Um, I felt like that before I came to AA, I thought other people didn't have families like mine, and uh and because I did, but of course they did, right? Because you all were there, right? You were all in high school. You all had the same family. But when I was young, I didn't know that. So I think that made me feel more distraught and more isolated. So then I went to a different high school, and then I got involved with a high school teacher with a man. And um, and it's funny because I'm gay all the way gay. I'm gay, gay, gay. And... Uh, <laughs> But I think that, um, honestly, I didn't even know about that. I, I, you know, I don't know why. I just didn't get the memo that there were gay people, you know, and I really didn't know there were gay people. Um, and so, uh, and it was just, and for me, being gay and being in Alcoholics Anonymous is very, very similar. The minute I think I saw my first lesbian, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's me. That's what I am, you know? And same thing with AA and alcoholics. Once I came in here on that Friday and I saw a room full of LGBT alcoholics and they were saying, yeah, my name is Joe. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, my name is Mary. I'm an alcoholic. I was like, wow, that's me. That's me, you know? So, um, so then I, um, dropped out of high school and, um, and, and when I, it's on, and I realized I was gay. And so by now I'm like maybe 16, 17. And, uh, that didn't go over so well at all. Um, I told my dad, uh, we, I went to a restaurant cause I was afraid and I wanted to be in public and we went to a restaurant and, um, you know, again, he, he, he didn't know either. He didn't know. And, uh, he, I told him I was gay and we'd already ordered and I can just remember it so clearly, you know, and he got up and he, you know, he said, we are so disappointed in you. And what makes, what makes me sad about that is that I was just so young, you know, I, you know, but I think when I see kids on the street and, um, I just, uh, well, I just think how, 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 how do they end up in that situation? You know, and it's funny when I first got sober as a waitress and then I started working at Larkin Street Youth Center, working with runaway kids. And that was so healing and it was so great. Um, I handed out condoms and bleach and all that stuff. It was again, you know, for HIV and needles and blah, blah, blah. And this was 84, 85. And I did that down in the tenderloin. 
But it was so healing, too, to be able to work with teenagers and, you know, people that had just, you know, like so many of us, you know, that have been in a rough spot. Some other things that happened, you know, I set my car on fire. I, uh, you know, was driving down, well, driving, of course, you know, driving up Highway 1. I was born and raised down in Santa Cruz and uh, driving up Highway 1 up to the city. I was all about Amelia's. Amelia's Amelia's was a lesbian bar, a legendary lesbian bar, and uh, it was everything to me. (laughs) It was truly everything to me, you know, and I moved to Valencia on 18th Street so I could be as close as humanly possible to Amelia's and uh, so but I started coming up I had a fake ID and I started coming up here again when I was 17 so uh so yeah my dad walked out of the restaurant and I it was a small restaurant too and I think the waitress felt sorry for me and I didn't know what to do and I remember and it's so clear I can remember it's raining so I moved out and uh you know I can see now, too, how, like, my mother and grandmother tried to stay connected to me. And I, this was just, I was just beginning to walk on the wild side. And, uh, you know, but even so, no matter how crazy I got, no matter how, um, how I looked, um, they really still tried to keep a connection to me, which I really made all the difference in the world. Um, I also, um, you know, just whatever. I got my wisdom teeth out, and uh, that night I got 86 from a bar in San Jose. It was called Desperados, and, uh, you know, on and on. So uh, I came in. So, so again, I tried to get treatment at 19 years old. I went to a Department of Public Health program. They were very kind. I think they really cared about me. It was not a 12-step-based program. And um, after two years, they asked me to leave. Um, like, it was a long waiting list, um, and uh, there were people that needed it. I had an ex-girlfriend. There were many little girlfriends along the way. And uh, this one girlfriend had been, I guess, an ACA or something. And so she had heard about Living Sober. And I don't know exactly how this all panned out, but she got me a registration, and that's how I came. So um, I wasn't really – I looked like a punk rocker, but really I was more of a poser. You know, I, I had really big purple mohawk. I um, wore chaps every single day. Um, and back in the 80s, people would wear chaps to bars, you know. I wore them every single day. I, um, I, uh, um, and, that, and, that, and I came into living sober, you know. And uh, I cannot say that anyone came rushing up to me to carry the message. I, uh, you know, and, but I really felt the good vibe, you know. I really felt the good vibe. And just to, just to give you a little picture, I mean, Ronald Reagan was president, you know, the, the Purple Rain, the movie, had just come out the week before. Um, you know, Madonna had just published uh, uh, been, uh, Like a Virgin, you know. Sheila E. was Glamorous Life, you know. And, uh, I mean, that, that was it, 1984. And uh, I, I remember that so clearly. I, um, I, uh, one of the things, you know, I think for me, the reason I was able to get sober so, I mean, it didn't feel quick, you know, but just the fact that it was my first AA me was I had that gift of desperation. And I think that's something when I'm working with, with people, it seems like if, if they have that gift of desperation, that seems to me one of the things that determines whether they're going to be successful or not. You know, I know some people who um, I think on some level have the desire to stop drinking, but I don't know. For me, the gift of desperation made me willing to um, just keep showing up and keep trying. Um, For me, the other thing that's really important is Tradition 3. And Tradition 3 is all about us. It's all about the LGBTs, okay? That's why we have Tradition 3, right? It's because, you know, in Akron, Ohio... Fellow came up and said, you know, the way it's written in the big book is it says, you know, I, I'm, I forget exactly how it is, but basically, you know, I'm different. You know, I, I have, I, mean, I have a condition, you know, that might make you unwilling to want me. And what it is, they, they said, and Bill W., this is a recording, he said, someone came and said, I am a sexual deviant. Those were the exact words. I am a sexual deviant. And one of the things, one of the many things I love about AA is that they knew we were there for all along, all along. You know, they said, do, do they have a desire to stop drinking? That's all they wanted to know. Marty Mann, who uh, was one of the very first women in um, AA as a lesbian, her partner, Priscilla, was uh, editor of Vogue. They were they were in the grapevine. It was like Bill, Priscilla, Marty. Okay, Bill, 
Bill was all about the gays, okay? You know, I, I wanted to bring a copy of Living Sober. Oh, thank you, Living Sober, written by Barry L., a gay man, right? I mean, we were there from the very, very beginning, and Bill and Bob they knew all about us. We didn't sneak in later. We didn't, you know, be like, oh, can, can we please be a part of it? No. We were there like on day one. Marty Mann, big lesbian. Bill was her sponsor. Okay? I mean, that means everything to me. You know? It means everything to me that we were there from the beginning, and we were accepted, and we, we were wanted there. Um... um what else can I tell you? I, you know, one of the things I've done um, to really help stay engaged is I've, I loved things like I've been back to Akron, Ohio. I went with Ruth and Dee. Dee has since passed. Um, bless her. I feel so strongly that she's here with us tonight. Um, and um, we, we went back to Akron, and it was beautiful. It was so great. Akron is the birthplace of AA, and contrary to what New York might want to tell you. And uh, they have so much cuteness between Akron and New York. Uh, and when I visited, uh, I visited the archives, and um, they actually have a little sign that says, that's not how we do it in Akron, right? And uh, they're so cute. And uh, But you can visit Dr. Bob's house. You can see exactly where um, where, where it all happened, uh, where Bill and Bob met. I, you can go to the um, uh, Mayflower Hotel, and they actually have the phone there, the pay phone, where Bill made the call that connected him to Bob. Girl, you know I got a picture of me standing with that phone, right? Okay. <laughs> I've also been, I, and I just really want to encourage all of you to do the same, because it is, man, talk about a tearjerker. I mean, Stepping Stones in New York, it's in Katona, that's where Bill and Lois lived. Uh, Lois lived, I mean, Lois lived 17 years after, uh, after Bill, and can we say, God bless Lois, oh my Lord. She's, for a million reasons, but she saved um, so many little things, and her little handwriting is on the things. You can see the letter that Carl, Dr. Carl Jung wrote all about spirituality and, you know, the, everything that Carl Jung had to tell us. It's like in a little Walgreens frame that costs like $2, and it's right there at Stepping Stone, and you can see it. You can sit at the table where Ebby and Bill had the conversation, where Ebby told Bill, you can have any kind of spiritual life you want. You can have any kind of, you choose your own God. And thank you, God, for me not forgetting to tell you that my first higher power was Grace Jones. Okay. Right. Oh, I'm so grateful. Yeah. And that, that's the kind of 21 year old I was. Okay. I, and I wasn't trying to be a pill. That was just the best idea I could come up with. I love Grace Jones. She seemed powerful. I said, I choose you. And, uh, I loved her. And the other thing is that the people were so patient with me. And I know sometimes too, I can feel like, um, you know, I don't, I don't ever want to be a bleeding deacon. You know, I really don't. I mean, when I, all I have to do when I start to feel all fussy about being an old-timer, I think about how I was, and I wish I could really walk the stage and stay connected to the mic, but I, me, am I, and I'm just saying, I don't mean every so often. I mean every day with the chaps. Every Monday chaps, Tuesday chaps, Wednesday chaps, Thursday chaps, right? My big hair. Me, the coffee pot. Oh, I got to get the cookies. I got to get the cigarette. I got to see who's dating who. I got to see, oh, I like her. I like her. No, that was me. I caused so much disruption in the meetings, you know. <laughs> and the best meeting was, I'm not the best, but my home group at the time was the Monday Night Waller Street meeting. And, um, oh, bless. It was such a blessing to me, you know. And those lesbians just took so good care of me. They just really helped me so much, and they loved me, even though I was disruptive, and even though I was a little on the immature side, and even though I kept getting the cookies and throughout the meeting. And um, I just really, I really have them to thank. I'm going to close here with uh, just one little tiny paragraph, um, if I can. And that is, um, it's from a vision for you. It says, we know what you are thinking. You are saying to yourself, I am jittery and alone. I couldn't do that. But you can. You forget that you have now tapped a source of power much greater than yourself. To duplicate with such backing what we have accomplished is only a matter of willingness, patience, and labor. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.